Before we begin, I would like to do an, a land acknowledgement and also a visual description. I am wearing a red sweater with a golden color um, head wrap. With my hair is up in twist and it's kind of a maroonish color. I have locks. I am a chocolate brown black woman with a gold hoop in her nose and bluish and purplish eyeshadow and fingernails <laughs> and lipstick. I'm wearing big gold leaf earrings. And um, I'm sitting in front of um, some plants and artwork and um, and gold sunflower looking um, piece on the walls and lots of plants. I am on the, the holy lands of the Lenape people um, in Manhattan. I live here in a community called Harlem. And I am really grateful to the original stewards of this land for making home for me. Um, I, I'm very appreciative. So folks, in a moment, we will be joined by Ashni. Ashni, daughter of Cynthia and Alan, is a farmer at Mumbet's Freedom Farm, facilitator, educator, and somatic experiencing practitioner born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, with rich roots in the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Movement music, healing, and their expansion through meditation and love are essential keys to Ashni's being. From early experiences with death, escapades and library stacks, to discovering yoga and teachings with Buddhist monks in high school, spirit has always piqued her curiosity and tickled her heart. From an early age, Ashni has been devoted to learning from and listening to spirit. Mumbet's Freedom Farm, where Ashni is the, the steward, is a black and brown led cooperative farm and community sanctuary situated in the ancestral homelands of the Mohican Nation, Sheffield, Massachusetts. Named after the revolutionary Elizabeth Mumbet Freeman, Freeman an enslaved African nurse, midwife and herbalist who successfully sued for her freedom. The farm serves as a space for connection, creativity, education, and wellness. Dedicated to sustainability and sanctuary, Mumbet's Freedom Farm seeks to provide a home for queer, Black, and Indigenous people of color and all Earth beings. We employ, Mumbet's Freedom Farm employs Afro-Indigenous regenerative and biodynamic agricultural strategies, drawing inspiration from personal and cultural gardening experiences. They focus on nurturing the soil through biodynamic preparations and diverse amendments. So one, so the one, one and a half acre um, farm will continue to flourish in the future. Their commitment to sustainability extends beyond resource preservation. They understand the land to be a living relative that sustains the beyond the material, therefore healing their relationship with the earth as the center of their work. Welcome, Ashni. I'm Sandra Ashni, Kimberly Tiffany Masai Itzel, daughter of Cynthia and Alan. I have, so I'm a brown skin, caramel colored woman with mermaid like hair. Um, I'm sitting in, um, Mohican, Stockbridge, Muncie territory in Western Massachusetts in a room on a wooden chair. There are, there's a little wooden beam above my head behind me, a skylight to the right and a God's eye behind me. I'm wearing um, gray and the lime green and emerald green beaded um, long dangly earrings and a soft cashmere gray dress. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Ashni. I, we were just together at Mumbet's Freedom Farm a few days ago, and I want to just give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your work and then ask me any questions um, in this moment where I've been talking a lot. And so <laughs> this is the time to, you know, get me, get me, give me some hard questions and let's, let's talk about this from the perspective of doing some land work, doing water work and the work that you do and the artwork that I and that I'm doing. Yes. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm just really honored to be here. So I want to just give thanks to my ancestors, guides, to this land that, that is holding me and all of the beings that have prayed me into this moment because I don't come here alone, which is why I name whose I am, my mother, my father, my um, plant um, relations. So that's part of who I am. I am a conglomerate of earth, air, fire, and water that has been born on this earth and this planet at this time to a woman um, of Caribbean descent. And I feel like my upbringing and being a, a child of an, of a, of a, what we, what we call an immigrant in our current language. Um, but a person who <laughs> um, grew up in the islands, who grew up on the land, but came to this, uh, United States of America, what they call that now, um, for opportunity. And so growing up, one of the first books that I remember reading was a book called Back to Eden. I'm not sure if anybody who's listening has heard of that book or know that book, but it's kind of like one of the oldest books that talk about like alternatives to healing. My mother was a nurse. She always wanted me to be a nurse, um, but I didn't want that. I was always kind of drawn to alternatives, alternative ways of healing, alternative ways of living, alternative ways of loving, alternative ways of being. So all of that and so many things along the way have led me to this moment where I am the current steward of Mumbet's Freedom Farm. Mumbet's Freedom Farm is a sanctuary um, and a space for healing, a space, a living love retory is what I'm calling it now. Um, because I feel like um, growing up as a child of an immigrant, there were a lot of things that were expected of me. And there were a lot of things that were put on me in terms of concepts of success, mm -hmm. of, of what was worthy of doing. Um, and as I continue to explore this land and explore what it, what freedom means, what it means to be liberated, um, I'm realizing that liberation is not about, okay, I'm liberated from something else, but I'm liberated to be in relationship. And so the work at Mom Bet's Freedom Farm is really rooted in what are the things that we can liberate ourselves from so that we can be in right relationship? And what are the ways that we can be free to explore the relationships and the ways of living that actually align with our heart, our soul, and what our bodies need? And how that also changes over time. So one thing I didn't say in my visual description, I'm in my, you know, I'm kind of, people don't usually do that, but I'm in my, you know, 40th decade of being on this planet. I have no shame in that. I'm really actually um, grateful. Um, something that you were speaking to earlier in this conversation, I can't remember exactly, but there's something about the miracle of, of my being, the miracle that I made it, that we have made it, because there was a lot of things that were done to kind of um, ensure that I wouldn't make it to this place, that I wouldn't survive. Um, and so I feel like Mom Bet's Freedom Farm is a sanctuary to like to honor um, the ways in which we have come through <laughs> and to give us spaces to celebrate that, to honor that, to nurture that, and to create platforms, structures, and systems so that more of us can um, really live into the miraculous nature of our lives and the life that we're living and we've been blessed to live. Um, and we do that by uh, honoring that um, we are the summation of a lot of things. You spoke about a lot of things, but I'll speak really briefly about the recognition of the plant, animal, and elemental life that make us up. I think that there is something that is so important and vital to being alive in this time um, as we see so many things shifting around us and the world, like you were talking about the world ending, this idea of the world ending, but what world are we talking about? Right. I feel in my heart and soul that there's part of my purpose that is part of being a part of this new world that is already existing. It's not like, oh, people talk about this new world. This world is here. It's for us to claim it. But in order for us to claim certain things, some things have to end, which is a certain sort of supremacy that exists 
in the minds, hearts, and bodies of so many. And that includes um, us as humans and the idea that we are above things, that we are somehow above. Um, I see the land um, and the work that I'm doing as sort of getting us back on, back, getting us back in a circle, getting us back into understanding what our part is and what our role is here on this earth in in birthing and and creating a world um that is um based on values of reciprocity that understands our symbiotic nature you know you spoke about before about black women and people doing this harm and not understanding that they're also doing that harm to themselves you know how we do harm to earth and nature how you know there are you know in the current wars that are happening in the world right now um are we talking about the the amount of um matter that is being bombarded to the earth and where that's going the smoke where is that going that's not you know that's in our atmosphere right the places that are being mined right now what's happening what are we concerned are we thinking about what's happening to the stone people to the lands and the veins that are being interrupted their flow being interrupted underground by mining for things like cobalt. So Lumbet's Freedom Farm, I can, you know, in my intro, you you can hear a little bit about what our missions and our values are, but really it is about this exploration of our elemental nature and how we can honor that there is something ending and the world, you know, I and I hopefully, and I'm praying for that world, um, of capitalist ideology, of um, a, a sort of supremacy that we have, that's starting to crumble and us starting to um, lean into our inter interdependence. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about the work that you're doing, and I had one, 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 one question that will lead into the more juicy questions about mm -hmm. what is being watered and what is being made whole again. And I heard you already talking a little bit about the climate reparations and environmental justice. And I'm wondering if that is, you know, also a part of what you are watering with this work that you're doing. Yeah, what is being watered? Um, I, I, I'm i gonna speak on behalf of what I'm seeing in, as I've been sitting with people. Literally, communities are being watered. And what I mean by that in particular is, there is um, <clears throat> multiple communities that I'm a part of where folks feel like they have not been allowed to be a part of this movement for environmental justice and that they've been relegated to the the to the the um the corners mm -hmm. because of who they are, because of who they love, because of how they, you know, where they come from, where they live. And what I feel like is like more people <clears throat> are seeing themselves as a part of the 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 work. They are being watered and they are watering. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that I am in spaces where this this idea of uh, uh, reparations is taking very taking a lot of different um, configurations. Right. Like the idea of what is reparations, the, the conversation about that, I find is really growing, starting with the acknowledgement of, of of what was what the harm, what needs to be repaired. Mm -hmm. And then there being a collective conversation about what does repair look like? Yeah. So this, this, there's this transformative justice, I think, aspect that I, I feel like is leading in, in many of the communities that I'm with, it's not like finger pointing and mm. you know, shaming, but yeah. it's really, the watering is happening is about how do we, how do we recognize and how do we, how do we um, move together as opposed to singling people out for harm. But yeah. those people who are part of those legacies of harm have to do their work too. Yeah. So that's the watering that's happening, you know, because for many of the communities that I'm in, there are folks with, with political economic power that actually 
have not had to stand up or move forward or say something because they've been protected by the larger political, you know, if the framework, they, the fact that they are saying something, I think has to do with a lot of ancestral watering and the current movement for reparations, climate reparations, environmental justice that are calling people to the carpet in ways that are, a calling in, but also a lifting up. Mm -hmm. I can talk a lot more. Yes. For me, the watering is really about how I take the resources and the and the time that I have and water where I can. Like, you know, telling the stories that I can, mm -hmm. being in the communities that I can be a part of, creating spaces for people to gather and learn and share and cry and heal and be in ceremony. Those are the ways that I am experiencing my capacity to water and also not be and, and to be left with something inside as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just I'm I'm so many things are bubbling and percolating in my my heart as you're talking um and there's something in there about the communities and the people that there wasn't space for them inside certain types of movements because of the way that they loved or the way that they looked or all of these things um there's something about the the seen and the unseen and also sort of the dismantling of this sort of um celebrity of it there's mm -hmm. something that I feel like returning to the core that each and every thing, there's a purpose, whether or not that it can be seen or, or not, whether it can be seen or not. And so I want to read a quote um, by Audre Lord. Um, yes, I want to read a quote by Audre Lord. Lord writes, I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal, and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. That the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. I am standing here as a Black lesbian poet, and the meaning of all that waits upon the fact that I am still alive and might not have been and so there's a couple things that are inside of there um related to like the seen and the unseen and take the risk of stepping into and being seen um and taking a stand within these movements and we see it now you know within our current culture there's so much of um people taking a stand and then being canceled or people taking a stand and then losing their jobs or people taking a stand and being um ostracized from their communities or their family or people taking a stand for who they are yes even sexual identity and yes. sorts of things it happens in the social it's happening at home mm -hmm. and so i wanted to just talk about risk and risk in relationship to the work um, the risk that it takes also for speaking up and giving a voice to those that normally do not have a voice, to bringing those people from behind the scenes into a little bit more into the spotlight. And just to talk about, you know, people talk about, there's a beautiful side of, la of that, of having the light shown upon you, but there's also the fear, and especially as a Black queer um, woman, Mm -hmm. loves in the, the way that I do there is a risk that is not oh it's not like rainbows and butterflies and ice cream cones you know so I wanted to just talk a little bit about the risk of actually giving voice to black women and also like you were speaking to you in that reading that beautiful reading about the water and the wind are not pleased y'all the water and the wind are not pleased and being a voice for those elements that also normally are looked at as voiceless. And what is the risk? What's your relationship to risk in that work, in this work, and giving the wind, what, and the water some voice, and also Black women? Big questions. Ooh, Ashley. <laughs> Honey, let me just say, let me just say, I, I, I mean, we could literally talk the next hour about this. Yes, we can. And we will, but not in the next hour. We will continue to talk about this. 
I just, I feel like I live my life on the edge of risk and, and, and reward, you know, mm -hmm. and then you never know that's the vulnerability. And, and as I'm, as, as I'm speaking, I feel my stomach just like, you know, girl, <laughs> is, are you about to talk about this? I just, you know, I think like, what's, what's really, what are we really protecting? what are we really protecting to not be in the practice of living our truths what are we really protecting by being homophobic and transphobic what are we really protecting by being extractive with the land and the water like what do we what are we really doing here mm. what is the point of it and mm. i think as a person who has never i mean i've i have I mean, uh, yeesh, you know. That part, what is the point? What is the point? And I love that question. Because There's nothing people, are saving. people, Yes, and people don't really talk about that, that actually being transphobic or homophobic or xenophobic actually is the protection of something. Yeah, and I just don't have any use for any of it. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, I don't have any use for it. It's not useful for the planet. It's not useful for my, my for spirit. It's not useful. Mm -hmm. And so the reality that, you know, is it, it, it for me? It's it's what I'm what is what I'm supposed to do to bring voice to the wind and the water that doesn't actually need me to do it. It speaks very loudly. Water and wind are speaking. They do. But for those of us who are not listening. It is risky to have, you know, a community of folks that live with risk all the time talking about y'all need to listen to the wind and the water. They already don't want to listen to us. They already don't want to listen to wind and water. But the reality is I don't see another life without me speaking with, not for, wind and water, with, not for, queer and trans communities, with, not for, you know, folks that are pushed to the margins. Mm -hmm. it, it, if I'm not doing that, then what is living? Mm -hmm. And the reality that I have is that, that I'm walking and moving in is that I live in a queer world. I live in a world where people are like, risk? Girl, I eat risk for breakfast. <laughs> What are you talking about? You talking about the risk that you have with all your comfort and access and gates that you keep, right? Mm. Like the reality of what to do with privilege. Mm. And, and if I'm talking about privilege from my positionality, then I'm wanting this conversation to get to people who have privilege and are not looking like we look, right? Mm -hmm. The, what do you do with your privilege? What do you do with the doors that you stand guard for? What do you do? What do I do? Is is open the fucking gates. <laughs> you know, what do I do? Go and listen and be re rerouted. What do I do? Take my assignments from queer black women, from trans and gender non-conforming folks that are like, yo, yo. Mm -hmm. When we're free, you're free. So get about the business of supporting this freedom work, yeah. right? Like this is the truth. This is my truth. It is a truth that maybe people in my past, my my ancestors could not be this risky. But for now, it's common damn sense. Yeah, you know that if we're talking about living in a liberated world, we cannot be talking about that at the same time taking every resource from the land. We can't do that while imprisoning people. We cannot do that while being, you know, at, at war at every moment. We can't do that while practicing all this phobia. We can't. We mm. can't. Mm. And so I really wish I could say that I'm like I'm tipping on a tightrope, mm. but I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah. Even with all of this mess going on, even with people I love having to negotiate and navigate how to live in this wild world i'm pretty comfortable even with the stuff that i have to face as a black woman i'm pretty comfortable so yeah my work the work that the way i've been called and my communities are very like talking about wind and water speaking talking about calling yourself be and having mentors and teachers and elders and folks that are looking at you because you say like not because they say but because i say I am about that life and about that work. They have expectations. 
The communities that I'm a part of have expectations. The, the, you know, you go and put your hands on a tree, that's an intimacy. Yeah. You go and walk in a river, that's an intimacy. My goodness. Mm -hmm. My goodness. And so um, again, I could talk, but the it's it's actually a life of risk to be quiet. Yes. It's a life of risk to even if you're not a talker, because everything I believe I don't say on the social media. Mm -hmm. But it's about the work, it's about the relationship building, it's about activating loving kindness, it's about you know, figuring out how people you love can change and then helping that. It's about figuring out how I need to change and doing that. Mm -hmm. It's about losing some relationships and to gain some new ones. It's, I mean, all of it, everything, nothing is sacred in that way. Everything can get, can, can be a part of the solution and some things that you think are part of the solutions and the relationship building, the community building, the work will be removed. Mm -hmm. Mm. And it's hard, but I don't see another way that I've I've lived it. I think thank you so much for sharing that. And I and I feel all of that so deeply. I just there's so much comfort. I mean, we are, you know, I I have a home right now. I'm warm. I have a, flowers in front of me. I'm dressed. I have water on demand on hey. tap. I can just open up the, you know, there's so many things for us to be grateful for. So risk is um relative mm. you know it really is relative um and i just i appreciate everything that you said and i have another question that speaks sort of to what you were saying about speaking and the voice and using your voice and even like what is is voice and this has to do with responsibility and you know i've heard a lot of people talk about the artist's responsibility the artist responding to what's happening socially and looking at that word responsibility i'm curious about your abilities you spoke a little bit about it just then but your abilities to be responsive to the world to listen to be with to work with to talk with um, the elements, um, to respond to injustice. How are these being cultivated through this artistic practice, praxis, through your practice in the name of the mother and this project in the name of the mother tree? Well, the work has required me to not be talking so much when I should be listening. Um, it is, it has been amazing but it's also been um I, 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 yeah I, I, hmm. say say it say the question again oh. what is my responsibility yeah how are your abilities to respond being cultivated how Quiet, are you silence mm -hmm. meditation being in nature, asking questions and actually readying my body for responses, mm. having hard conversations with people, letting things go to be more present. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, going back to our last question that for some people, all of the things that you just shared could be considered risky, could be considered risky. You know, letting go of relationships, taking the time to have meditation to to listen, um, and 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 actually going back to what you said, also it is more risky perhaps for those people who are invested in the systems that keep them comfortable, you know, um, and maybe not so much for for folks that look like us. And I do know that for sometimes for me as a black woman, because I feel this level of responsibility to the community, to all of my relatives, um, that sometimes, you know, my practice, even though I am very diligent about it and I make space for it, sometimes it feels like, oh my goodness, if I do that thing, I'm taking time and energy away from something oh, else that I could yeah. be doing. You know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, just honoring the complexity of what we're talking about in risk and response. Right. There are so many things that I've learned now you know, um, 
I, I could continue, I could continue a list, but the reality is, you know, you can't, you can't be in a ritual that you haven't been initiated into. Mm. You like the, the work at home that no one sees the work in the woods, mm. the work traveling, the work of sitting around the table, the sojourning internally and externally is where the actual work is happening, is where the rerouting is happening, is where the reserves are being recouped and filled up, you know, um, is where I'm being also, I'm learning lessons left and right. I am being taught. Mm. And I love, I love to be in a war. I love to be in communities where folks are like, good job, Ebony, but also these five things, you know? <laughs> yes. But also because you're here, because you're doing this work, you say these five things, these things to listen to, those signs you missed, those people you should talk to. What about that? Mm -hmm. And are you paying people equitably? And are you listening to folks? And where are the elders? And where are the spiritualists? And like, if you're going to do it, do it. Or if not, just do something else. Mm, so true. it's all of that. It's rigor. Mm. And that that's the part of it. Like the rigor can drive people away and can bring people close. Mm. That's that, risky. That part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. I want to talk to you for another hour, but I know our time is up. <laughs> Our time is 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 for now. For now. for now. In this final moment, I wanna I want to let folks know that Ashni and I are cooking up something risky <laughs> for you for for folks who will be probably and rigorous. By this airs. and rigorous and rigorous risky <laughs> ritual of rigor. Yes. Uh, the folks that will be seeing this will, we will already be in a process of bringing people, you know, of, of inviting people to the sacred lands of Mumbet's Freedom Farm. But do you want to say one word before you go about what we are, what we are planning and just a little bit about what we're planning and then we will wrap this up. You're planning an immersion mm -hmm. on the land and exploring what it means to be in relationship with ourselves and our bodies in an ever-changing world, in a world that is supposedly falling apart. Um, so we are going to be engaging in a process together for a week on the land, with the land, exploring and listening mm -hmm. um, and utilizing our bodies, our minds, our hearts to um, investigate, explore, um, and be in conversationship. conversationship conversationship um with the land and with each other <laughs> thank you ashley i appreciate you in the all of the social media around this um this conversation series we'll be sharing information about my best freedom farm how people can stay in touch how people can support the work of Mumbet's freedom farm and all of the other folks that we are work we are working with and collaborating with Ashmi, have a beautiful day. Thank you for your questions. And more soon. More soon. Peace. Peace.